time times a half time. Well, that's a het. That's a, a perimeter, an extent, a, a fenced area. This would be what it would be until the end of the fragmenting, of the fracturing of the, of the hands of the Kadosh people. What do you put in a basket that crumbles, fragments, and the basket means to be filled up? Until the time of the end of the fragmenting, the fracturing, the hand of the Kadosh people, till all these things be accomplished. Do it, and he says, well, I heard, but I, I couldn't grab it. I couldn't, I didn't understand. Yod is that grabbing hand. It's the antithesis of Yod. I couldn't grab it. He says, could you tell me again, like an open hand of the letter Kaf, could you tell me again, what is the end of these matters? And he says, Lecha, go, Daniel, the shepherd said, go, Lecha, go, Daniel, for the words are hidden and sealed to the time of the end. Are hidden and sealed, letter now, like encapsulated in this womb. You can't see it until it's birthed out. The words are hidden and sealed to the time of the end. No, they will be elucidated, clarified, and refined by many. Well, those are action words. Noon is the action letter. The wicked shall do wickedly. Samic, the place of the stature of the menorah of doing righteousness or doing wickedness, like a good steward or a bad servant. The wicked shall do wickedly. I am. None of the wicked shall understand. That has to do with understanding. But the righteous will understand. The letter pay. What is pay? The mouth open according to the words that he gave us. The righteous will understand. Then he goes and says, from the time that the uh, that the mute abomination, or the abomination, the abomination of desolation, is put up in place. I forget exactly the way that's phrased. What's an abomination of desolation? Well, the word, if this lines up with the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the, it's not the Ark of the Covenant, it's the Ark of the Testimony. The testimony was the Decalogue, the ten statements put on the tables of stone. Those words will bring life. Those words are his mouth, which tells us the way it is, which brings life and prosperity and sanity and peace to the people of Israel. To say, oh, this don't matter anymore. That is to make mute those words which bring abomination and desolation, which is distortion and squelching of all the promises of Yahweh. So in spite of what anybody else says about the abomination and desolation, burying Arapath's bones on the Temple Mount, or setting up a nuke as a missile silo in Jerusalem, or whatever it might be, if you simply silence the words of life is the mute abomination of desolation. And he said, it will be, and then he gives a certain extent, which is another overview. So the two letters that has to do with 1290 years, or time times and a half time, het is like the big white fence, remember? And the kuf is like the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke that was over the camp. So it's like the treasure chest and the cap over it, which is another kuf concept. So therefore, it fits, it fits this pattern where he says it'll be so many years Blessed is the man, Resh, Resh is an exalted man. Blessed is the man who comes to 1,330 years. But for you, Daniel, go your way, live out your days. Sheen is like a fire of the spirit. Live out your days, and you will come to your end and rest. And you will arise. There's the promise of the sign of his word. You will arise to your portion at the end of days. That's the end of what he told Daniel to do. But in verse 4, he said, hide the words and seal the book. And then down here, he said, the words are hidden and sealed in verse 9. What did Daniel do? Daniel hides the words and sealed the book. Okay, the words are hidden and All you see is Daniel said, I looked and I saw one on this side of the river and that side of the river. I saw one above the river and he held up his hands for him and he looked forever and I asked him what time would be. He said, time, time, time. What did Daniel do? What I'm proposing is that Daniel hid the paleo letters and turned the aleph into the modern flame letters and the letter bet and the letter gimel and the letter dalit and the letter hay and the letter vav and the letter zion and the letter het. And by putting them in the flame letters, they lost their meaning. When he, the word for hide and seal is heptav mem and samitav mem, which means obscure, obfuscate, make anonymous opinion. Can I make ask a general? question about yes. the actual, when you said he distorted it, or changed, not distorted, but changed it. Altered the lettering style. This Thank is my you. proposal, was my it, hypothesis. Do you think it was that block script, or do you think it was like Aramaic? Okay, this is where your other yeah. friend who was here might have a point of view. My thinking is, when Andrew Gabriel Roth wrote AENT, he first published one which is in this strange shape of letters that I don't recognize, and he said that was Aramaic. Then he published the same version in Hebrew letters, which also was Aramaic, but it's the same lettering style. It's like English and Spanish and French using the same shape of letters that comes from the Latin base, but yet they're pronounced completely different and mean different things. Now, somebody like your friend might have more information than me in regard to this, but when was Aramaic first used? Now, if she says, hey, that's the Assyrian language, I'm saying that this alphabet comes from before creation, I which is that. not Jewish, which is not Christian. 
When was the first Hebrew? Well, the first guy named Eber was Abraham's granddaddy. Abraham was called the first Hebrew because he crossed over. And then the Jews are the sons of Judah, but Israel is the 12 tribes. And so anybody who crosses over is known as an Ivrit. If anybody says, well, which came first, Hebrew or Aramaic? It's missing the point. The point is, this is Yahweh's language and his message embedded in this. And he said, the Elohim of Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, there was no technically person that was called a Hebrew other than Abraham was known as the Eber, the Ivri, the one who crossed over. It's not a matter of arguing, I don't think, about Aramaic or Hebrew or Jew or Esau or Jacob. That's not the point. It's almost like sidestep the issue and say, this is about the meanings of these letters. Got it. You don't even so, have to go. I, I, you can carry on what you're saying. I, I get it. Okay. So we, we're out of time to stop. Does anybody else have any comments or questions? You were about to, um, maybe I missed it, but you were talking about the virgins and the oil, and you were going to talk about the meaning of go by. Did I miss that? No, no, I didn't elaborate. I was talking about the word oil. And so what I'm suggesting, I'm suggesting as a type of study, that when there's a New Testament concept based on a New Testament word, and you can't figure it out in English or Greek, look back at the Hebrew reference. And if you can't figure out what the Hebrew object reference is, look at the word and how the word is spelled. And what I'm saying is that if the word oil is spelled shin mem nun, and shin mem nun yod is eight, and it lines up with shemini, which is shemini atzeret, which is the last festival, it lines up with the Ark of the Covenant, which lines up with the letter Zadi, which has to do with being righteousness, and if the Shem of Yahweh is for us to do Zadikah and Mishvah, which is righteousness and right ruling, as we treat into one another with kindness, chen and chesed, and mercy and rahem, which is the warm tenderness of affection towards one another, forgiving one another and praying for our enemies, then the standards what Yahweh gave us in the ten Devarim is the matters is to say, this is how we show our love to Yahweh, regard his name and his day. And if we have his name and his day, we're not going to have false Elohim. If we lose his name in his day, hey, Christian, do you hear that? If we lose his name in his day because we've been lied to by our forefathers and the teachers that we've brought unto ourselves, we have to go back to the words that say this is the name in his day. That's the first half of the Ten Commandments. The second half of the Ten, ten Commandments is how we relate to each other, which is Zadikah Mishvat, which is Zadikah is righteousness expressed. Mishvat is right ruling, which is justice between us. And Chesed, which is tender loving kindness, and Ten, which is grace and mercy, and Rechem, which is a warm affection towards one another. Now, sometimes that's difficult when we offend each other, but what I'm saying is I've scoured the Old Testament looking for every single time Yahweh expressed a disapproval with the way his people were acting, and it was always those matters. Zadikah and Mishvat. And then it was, he said, have Emmet and Chesed around your neck. Truth and kindness. He says, you guys keep doing injustice to each other. And then he even said, you guys lord it over each other. Is this the fast that I've required for you that you just don't eat? Better you should go out and feed the hungry. Better that you should go out and help the poor, the widows, the orphan. Part of giving this talk is to take to us who have been starving because those guys have lied to us. But it's not their fault. It's the devil. No, it's not his fault. It's Yahweh's fault. Thank you, Yahweh, for opening this up. We have been starving. We have been lied to. None of us are wealthy enough to buy this information, but here it sits for free. So we're giving it away for free. We're talking about these matters to the Shem, to the, to the, kado, to the Kadosh, making Kadosh, the Shem Hagadol Yahweh, to the great majesty of the exalted name of Yahweh in adoration. The word adore, Aleph Dalit Resh, is to mean to, to honor, to embellish. When we get the word adore, that's what he adored, adorned himself with his festivals and his Sabbath day. There's another verse that I found, I, I'm not trying to look it up right now, I've got it written down here, where Yahweh says, I adorned myself with the embellishments that I love this stuff. And I gave it to my woman she thinks it stinks. And so because she thought my stuff stinks, and she threw it away in disgust, then what happened to her is that she became repulsive, and everybody thinks that she stinks, and they have her held in disgust. And I find it really interesting that Yahweh says, he gave us his stuff. This is a systematic mechanics of the way the universe works as he designed it. He gave us his stuff because this was the best he had. And the attitude we have regarding his stuff is what becomes of us. He said, if you plug your ears when I speak, I plug my ears when you scream. I gave you my best, and if you think it stinks, you become the stinking one. 
But all we have to do is change our attitude about his words and the circumstances about us will change. But if nobody talks about it, if all we do is say, I've got to make a buck here, it's not going to change. And so what I think is happening is that if we talk about his words and say, okay, okay, but now how do we keep the Sabbath day? How do we keep the festivals? What's the right calendar? It's like, look, I'm not sure. There's a lot of different voices. There's the lunar Sabbath. There's the weekly seven-day Sabbath. There's the Nassim calendar stuff. And it's like, it's all a matter of discussion. But the first step is to have a regard of his ways. And people say, doesn't it? I was going to a, a, a four-square church, and the Seventh-day Adventist had brought the matters to me, this book, the Mark Bible. I looked at it, and I was thinking about it, and I said to so the Seventh-day pastor, and so I said, can I talk to you about the Sabbath thing? And he says, no, it's not an issue. I said, okay. I'd like to officially make it an issue and present it for you. Can I talk to you about the Sabbath? <laughs> he said, no, it's a non-issue. Well, what? What? Wow. The violent... It's like, wow. And he caused me, by that response, to see for myself. Because he said, no, I will not discuss it. I will not entertain it. We won't even go there. It ain't going to happen. Why? Was he intending to keep me in darkness? Was he intending to keep me in chains? Did, was he told by his superiors, do not address that matter? And yet Yahweh says, at the end of the Ten Commandments, I think it's Exodus 30, Moses is about to come down the mountain. He's already given the plan for the Mishkan and everything else. And Yahweh says, oh, one more thing, Moses. Tell my children of Israel, they must keep the Sabbath day. And he says it like four times in this one passage. Right as he's coming down the mountain, he could have picked any of the other Ten Commandments, and he picks this one thing, they must keep the Sabbath day. So here's the thing. Imagine if you've got a new electronic device that's supposed to be the greatest tool ever, better than a computer, do all these wonderful things, and somebody says, listen, you got to plug it in, or else it's not. you got to plug it in. Remember, you got to plug it in, charge this thing up, and you go running off with it. I don't even know what it means to plug it in. This dang thing doesn't work. What are you talking about? It's the same thing. For Israel not to keep the Sabbath day is to not be plugged in. We've got no power. We've got no Jews. And our enemies know it. And our enemies have infiltrated our seminaries and our pulpits and our educational system and our governments. And they're